Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Sephrata Live, and it's time for another daily dose of Lord of the Rings spoilers. So today we kick off week two of spoiler season, and we got some interesting cards to talk about, including the first ever legendary instant in magic. So we should probably jump right into it and start talking sweet new cards. Before we do, two quick reminders. Number one, if you need any of these cards, you can snag them from our sponsor card kingdom over at cardkingdom.com slash mtg goldfish and number two to keep up on all the latest spoilers throughout the day you should head on over to mtgpreviews.com anyway let's talk lord of the rings first up today we got a new arwen an arwen mortal queen so a three mana celesnia mythic legendary elf noble it says it enters a battlefield with an indestructible counter on it and then you can pay one remove an indestructible counter from it another target creature gets indestructible to end a turn you put a plus one plus one counter and a lifelink creature on that counter and a plus one plus one counter and a lifelink counter on arwen so arwen essentially indestructible but then it can give up its indestructibility to save another creature for the turn and give both of them lifelink this is actually a pretty interesting card just because indestructibility normally doesn't come this cheap i was actually looking back through all of magic trying to find three mana indestructible creatures and the only one i could find is dark steel mirror and dark steel mirror obviously it's a zero one so it isn't very good in combat at all doesn't have any extra upsides so just the fact that this is a three mana two two indestructible that's notable how notable that is in 2023 remains to be seen but then you get this indestructible creature that as long as it sits out it's gonna block forever gonna be able to attack into anything you want good at wearing equipment and auras and all that kind of stuff and then you can turn it into a 3-3 lifelinker and save another creature so it kind of turns into a shauna and puts a squire's devotion on something so i think that arwen it's going to be really interesting to see just how good this card is. The upside is it does fizzle a lot of removal. If you look at a format like Modern, Arwen's not going to get Furied, one of the most played cards in the format. It's not going to get Fatal Push. On the other hand, it's 2023, and there's a lot of exile-based removal, like Solitude or Path to Exile just doesn't care about indestructibility. It's going to kill Arwen anyway. Even Bounce is like kind of good against it. It gets around the indestructible, but you can recast it. And even in formats like Standard, or I guess El me since this isn't legal and actual standard there's so many exile rests there's farewells and sunfalls so i'm not sure just how good being indestructible is in 2023 so what do you actually do with arwen i think there's a couple of possible directions it could be really cute in a plus one plus one counter style deck uh, with hardened scales and the ozolith there are ways that you can maybe get the indestructibility counter on the ozolith like if you bounce your arwen or it gets exiled or something so that's kind of a cool bonus that you can move that around and then Harden Scales, it doesn't give an extra indestructibility counter, but it does work with the plus one plus one counter. So when you activate Arwen, you're going to get two plus one plus one counters on it. So it's going to be a four four life linker and do that to another creature as well. So I could see some sort of like Harden Scales deck taking advantage of it. I kind of wish this card was legal in Pioneer or even in Standard. I think in Modern, the big problem with Harden Scales in Modern is it's really an artifact synergy deck. It's built around Arcbound Ravager and a bunch of cheap artifact creatures in Modular. So even though Arwen works really well with Hardened Scales, I don't know if it works in the modern builds of Hardened Scales. Another interesting possibility is to go more the enchantment route. Like this is because of indestructibility, a pretty powerful threat to load up with rankers and load up with other auras because it is going to have this layer of protection that makes it hard to kill. Like we talked about, exile based removal can still get rid of it, but maybe this could show up in some sort of like Bogglesy style deck, some sort of Srom style deck. Another possibility is to go the blink route like you can use blink to reset the indestructibility counter on arwen so you can activate it give something else indestructible put the counters on it and then if your opponent tries to kill your arwen just ephemerate it or whatever to get indestructibility again be able to use its ability again so that's another potential possibility there is maybe the hope for some sort of proliferate deck that might be the most hilarious way to go with this no idea if this deck can actually compete but there's actually a lot of cheap proliferate creatures now Watley's raptor kinker bloom Arwen, if you can start proliferating the indestructibility counter, 
it gets really scary because then you can start removing the counters to protect your other team and grow the other members of your team, but not lose the indestructibility on Arwen. So I'm hoping to put this together in modern, maybe like some sort of budget magic style deck. I don't know if it'll be competitive enough, but there are the pieces to build some sort of like green, white, plus one, plus one counter proliferate Arwen style indestructible deck. So it seems like a cool option, at least as far as commander is concerned, I think you kind of embrace all the things that we've been talking about. You got cards like Lizelle that can add extra indestructibility counters. You got tons of good proliferation, Contagion Engine. You got the Hardened Scales effects. One of the sneaky all-stars, I think, in this deck is Contractual Safeguard, which is one of the Commander Precon cards from, I want to say, New Capenna, so like a year ago. This is a card I've never actually really seen anyone play, but it seems so perfect for Arwen. So it's three mana. If you cast it during your main phase, you put a shield counter on a creature you control. More more importantly, it says choose a kind of counter on a creature you control. Put a counter of that kind on each other creature you control. So this is a way for three mana instant speed. You can play your Arwen and then contractual safeguard and put an indestructible counter on your entire team. Sure, you might still get blown out by your farewell or a sunfall or whatever, but this is going to fizzle a lot of removal. And this is really, really cheap. Like both pieces are only three mana. You can be playing Arwen as your commander. So keep contractual safeguard in mind. It seems like one of the best cards in an Arwen win deck the other place this will probably show up is in the 99 of like proliferate decks uh, atrox is still one of the most popular commanders people just love proliferating any sort of proliferate shell this seems really solid like you get the indestructibility counters this can protect your team the plus one plus one counters work well with proliferate also really good in pierre the pulverizer just because pierre cares about as many unique counters as possible and arwen has an indestructible counter which is a really rare counter on cheap creatures yeah you got the miosian or whatever that are eight mana, nine mana. But if you want a cheap creature with an indestructible counter, uh, Arwen is the way to go now. So perfect for Pierre. One thing I did want to mention about Arwen that's a bit of a non-bow is it doesn't work with Kindred Moon. A Kindred Moon seems like the perfect card to work with Arwen, but Kindred Moon actually puts a divinity counter on a creature. And then the divinity counters give indestructible things to Kindred Moon. So even though the divinity counter works like indestructible counter, it's actually not an indestructible counter so something to keep in mind as you're building your deck so arwen definitely notable just how cheap it is like we don't get indestructible creatures this cheap and it does have a lot of upside I wonder if it's fast enough to actually work in modern. Like the most obvious homes, like the Hardened Scales deck, it just doesn't quite line up with the modern format. Worst case, it seems like a fun build around for the proliferate deck and interesting and plus one, plus one counter matters, weird counters matters, proliferate style commander decks with plenty of pieces to build around it as your commander if you want to. Speaking of mythics, we got another really sweet one in Aradagast the Brown. So four mana two five, it's a green, card it's a legendary avatar wizard it says when it or another non-token creature enters a battlefield under your control look at the top x cards of your library where x is that creature's mana value so if you play radagras you get to look at your top four cards and then you can reveal a creature card from among those that doesn't share a creature type with a creature you control put it in your hand the rest go on the bottom of your library in a random order so by itself you play radagras you look at your top four cards you can grab a non-avatar non-wizard creature so pretty much ETB draw creature from your top four avatar and wizard not a super popular creature type especially in green more importantly it's gonna do this for the next creature you play and the next creature you play this card actually seems like a really really frightening source of card advantage if you're willing to build around it a little bit so obvious comparisons there's only a couple of cards in magic that actually care about creatures that don't share a creature type but uh, volo guide to monsters volo itinerant scholar these are the only two cards that really care about this i think in many ways radagast is just the best of these cards like it has the most powerful ability the big problem especially with volo guide to monsters which is a really cool card but you need to play it and it needs to sit out on the battlefield to do anything radagast if it sits out on the battlefield, it's going to generate a ridiculous amount of value, but you also get its ETB trigger, so it does something right away. So if it ends up dying, like, at least you got value out of it. It replaces itself. So I think this is the strongest version of the play a bunch of different creature type cards. The only downside is it is mono green, which is relevant for Commander. As far as seeing play in a format like Modern, my big concern is it doesn't work with Coco, and that seems like the obvious home for a card like this. Some sort of really creature-heavy 
collect a company style shell, but being four mana means you can't collect a company into it, and collect a company is a really strong card. It seems hard for Radagast to actually beat out, so we'll have to wait and see. That said, I could see this being a good, like, enigmatic incarnation style card. So far, the archetype is mostly taken off in Pioneer rather than Modern, although we have seen it in Modern, like, a little bit, but incarnation naturally plays creatures of different types, like you got Atroxas and Titan of Industries and Agent of Tracheries and Alice Norns, so you can use, like, your enigmatic incarnation to find your Radagast, and then as you're firesing your creatures into play, you're just drawing these other big bombs to put in your hand to cast the next turn to draw even more cards so it can snowball really really hard also seems hilarious with genesis wave uh, this is probably more of a commander thing but if you can build your deck with a bunch of different creature types and then genesis wave and hit radagast and a bunch of other creatures you are going to draw a ridiculous number of cards because remember this works whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield so it's not a cast trigger so you can blink things you can genesis wave things and still get this value as far as commander i mean seems like an obvious addition to like volo decks uh, if you're playing volo i think this is just worth it in your deck so that's one home you could also build like mono green volo with radagross as your commander kind of the same thing that you would want in a volo guide to monsters deck the same way you'd build a deck, that's essentially what you want to do with Radagast. Just play a bunch of creatures of different types. There's also some other sneaky homes for this card. As I mentioned before, because this triggers from the creature entering the battlefield, it works really well with Blink. So you could play this in like Rune, you could play this in Lagrella like Blink decks. Also seems great in Yarok decks where you double up the ETB. So you have your Eric, your Radagast, you're going to draw two cards. And then when the next creature you're playing, you're probably going to draw two more cards. And you're really going to flood the board with creatures super quickly. Of course, this is assuming you do a little bit of deck building work. Like, if you're playing Yarok and it's Elf Tribal or something, then Radagrass is going to be horrible. You do want to keep in mind that you need a bunch of different creature types or Radagrass isn't going to do anything. Although, I don't think this is as hard as people actually might think. But I was looking through EDH Rec, just like the most played creatures in a Yarok style shell, and a lot of them just naturally have different creature types. Like, this is a list of, I think, 17 of the like 25 most played creatures in Yarok and they just kind of all naturally work with Radagast. Like, so yes, you do got to keep in mind that you want to play a bunch of different creature types, but I don't actually think it takes that much deck building work. I actually think if you just built like EDH rec version of Yarok, you could play Radagast and it's probably going to generate enough value to be worth a slot in your deck. And then as you're building the deck, you can just make sure you don't have like too many elves. That would be an easy creature type to have too many of. Too many humans. That would be another one that would be easy to have too many of and really fizzle Radagross, but I actually think this card could be really good. I'm planning on getting a copy and throwing it in my Yarok deck because I think it's just going to draw enough cards to be worth it. So Radagast is a 4-mana 2-5, not super convinced that it can make it in a modern deck. Maybe there is some like cool against the odds brew for it, but it seems like a really powerful commander card. And compared to past different creature type matters cards like Volos, this is, I think, the best of the much just because you get that ETB trigger. So even if Radagast dies, at least it's generating value before it hits the graveyard or goes back to the command zone. We also got a pretty interesting new removal spell in Isildur's Fate full strike so Isildur's fateful strike four mana legendary instant the first legendary instant we have ever seen in magic it says destroy target creature if its controller has more than four cards in hand they exhale cards from their hand to equal the difference so four mana blow up a creature and its controller goes down to four cards in hand and anything they have to discard goes to exile which is better than discarding so the legendary instant thing we've never had a legendary instant before but we do have a cycle of legendary sorceries and Isildur's fateful strike works the same way because it's a legendary spell you can only cast it if you control a legendary creature or planeswalker so if you don't have a legendary creature or planeswalker on the battlefield Isildur's Fateful Strike gonna get stuck in your hand just like Urza's Ruinous Blast, Yagmas Vile Offering, the rest of the legendary sorcery cycle so is this card good let's assume you have a legend so you're gonna be able to cast it what are you getting out of this spell and I guess the baseline is four mana murder plus 
an upgraded mind rot, maybe? Like, if your opponent only has two or three or four cards in hand, the discard mode doesn't do anything. On the other hand, if your opponent has seven cards in hand, they're exiling three cards. If somehow your opponent just drew a ton of cards, uh, you're going to be making them discard or exile a ridiculous amount of cards from their hand. So first off, as far as modern is concerned, uh, it's just a non-starter. Like, four mana for a murder is just too much. In modern, you mostly want your removal to be free or to cost, like, one mana. Four mana is just way 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 too much even with a little bit upside of maybe making your opponent discard some cards it's just too expensive so it's not gonna work there and plus you got the drawback of needing a legend we haven't really seen the legendary sorceries take off in competitive formats because they're risky there's gonna be times when your board gets wrath and your removal spell is stuck in hand when you really need to be casting it so forget about modern it's not happening so what about in commander is this a good commander card so on one level in Commander, you're always going to have Legends. Not only are there a ton of Legends these days, but you got a Legend in your Command Zone. So being a Legendary Instant isn't that big of a drawback. It still is a bit of a drawback, because again, if your board gets Wrath or something, you're not going to be able to cast this Do you play another Legend, but still not super intimidated by needing to have a Legend. So I guess on one level, you could play this in any black deck you want. Like, you could throw it in Karak or Shieldred or Yagmoth. It doesn't really matter, although I'm actually a little skeptical that I would want to play this is just a generic removal spell because I feel like not only is it inefficient like four mana to blow up a creature that's pretty expensive even in commander like you want your target removal to be like swords to plowshares or even a doom blade that's one or two mana not four mana plus I'm not a huge fan of just one on one target removal anyway in a four player format uh, but I think the big problem with this card is it's gonna really annoy the person that you end up killing their creature. I think it's essentially like the reverse Arcane Denial. Arcane Denial is a really, really popular commander counter spell, even though you're giving the person whose spell you countered two cards, and you're also getting one card. Uh, but part of the reason people love playing Arcane Denial is it's a way you can stop a threat that you really need to stop, but it doesn't feel as bad to the person getting their spell countered as uh, just a hard counter if you just straight up counter a spell that because they're like okay like yeah it sucks i really want to resolve that but at least i'm drawing a couple of cards isildur's fateful strike is like the opposite you are inefficiently blowing up a creature and then you're also probably making the person whose creature it was discard two or three cards it is going to make an enemy and i don't think that isildur's fateful strike is strong enough to actually want me to make an enemy like i think i would rather just kill the creature and not make my opponent exile cards from their hand just in a generic sense just a in a vacuum in a game of commander i don't think the upside of making your opponent exile some cards is going to be worth angering someone and making an enemy at the table when if you just doom bladed their creature they're going to probably be like okay whatever like eh, it's a bummer i wanted that creature but i get it it needed to go when you establish faithful strike you're doom blading it and also making them discard some cards which is really going to enrage your opponent on the other hand there are scenarios where i like this card so one would be let's say you got the reliquary tower in your play group and you know that person who's just always has 15 cards in hand and their whole game plan is just to like draw as many cards as possible and hold them in their hand and counter all your stuff and be super obnoxious against a deck like that i love isildur's fateful strike if you have someone who's built around just having this massive full hand of cards then i think this card's really good because it's gonna punish that play pattern and that's a play pattern that deserves to be punished as much as i love drawing cards it is fair that someone is gonna be like i don't think you should just be able to sit there with 20 cards in your hand that's not how commander is supposed to work another scenario this is really good is against mass card draw effects like i played a commander game recently where someone played galta and then rich cars expertise and draw 12 cards that is a really really big swing there wasn't a reliquary tower or anything but that is still a ton of cards to use on that turn isildur's fateful strike is a pretty good answer to that because it's an instant you can wait until your opponent draws all these cards and when they put their first spell on the stack or play the free card with Rishkar's expertise you're just like okay uh Isildur's fateful strike get rid of your Galta and now right not at the end of turn not next turn not at your end step not anything like that now you have to go down to four cards in hand so you really undo a mass card draw effect which is something else that I think is really powerful so I think those are the scenarios I'd be especially excited for Isildur's fateful strike where you're just hating on these huge card draw effects it's putting one player super far ahead so if you're just like blowing up a random creature 
I don't think it's worth taking the the heat from an opponent to make them discard a couple of cards for no reason. On the other hand, when someone's doing something busted and drawing a ridiculous amount of cards with reliquary towers or these huge card draw effects, Isildur's Fateful Strike is a really nice answer. The other thing that makes this card interesting is the fact that it is legendary. As much as being a legendary insta is a drawback because you gotta have a legend on the battlefield, it can also be an upside. It means Captain Sisse can tutor it up because it tutors any legendary card. So now you have a instant speed removal spell that you can just tap Captain Sisse and grab and kill something. The other place this is really sweet is in some legendary matter decks. Like this is a removal spell that'll cascade with Jota. You can cast it from your graveyard with Kesseth or Nashi because it's a legend. It'll draw you a card if you have a Shaunid or a Riki because it's legendary. So in decks that specifically care about legends, this does something pretty unique. This is a not a great removal spell, but it is a removal spell that is going to synergize with the plan of your deck. So I think that's the main home for this card. I, I wouldn't play it in modern. It's just too expensive for modern. But in Legendary Matters decks, or if you have someone in your playgroup that's just all about drawing as many cards as possible, then I think Isildur Faithful Strike can be a pretty reasonable option in your removal slot. As far as lower rarity cards, we got a new black uncommon legend in Grima Worm Tongue. So 3 mana 1 for a legendary human advisor. So your opponents can't gain life and you can tap it and sack another creature to have target player lose a life and if you sacked a creature that was legendary you amass orcs too so you're gonna end up with a 2-2 two, two orc army token so grima uh, i don't know how good this card is so as far as actually seeing competitive play it seems like mostly just a worse version of knight of dust shadow and knight of dust shadow doesn't really see a significant amount of play so i'm not super convinced that grima is going to be a card that shows up in you know modern or whatever i guess if you really want to hit on life gain it does get the job done and maybe in a like legendary matters deck that wants to hate on life gain maybe grima would be better than knight of dust shadow but in general i think we just have better options for this in 60 card formats in commander could be interesting in rotted Robic. like that's a legendary matters commander that also really cares about sacrificing so maybe grima could have a home there also worth mentioning grima does have some additional upside with the ring mechanic because remember we've talked about this throughout spoiler season but but remember the first mode on the ring turns the ring bearer legendary so that's gonna allow it to work with grima's ability to amass orcs when you sacrifice it so maybe there's some shell with like golem patient plotter which can let the ring tempt you and then wants to be sacrificed maybe there's some shell there that could make grima work worst case if you just really want to ruin your friend's day and they have a life gain deck grima is gonna get the job done like imagine showing up to your friend's commander night and you know your friend's playing like a heliod sun crown deck and you show up with grima your friends are going to absolutely hate you you just like absolutely take the life game player out of the game so maybe there's some troll value but overall I think Grima yeah it's kind of a mid power maybe not quite good enough for most decks hate card although in the right scenario it can be pretty funny we also got a common land that I think is actually really good great hole of the Citadel so it's a land it's a common it makes it colorless or you can pay one to add two mana of any combination of colors to spend only to cast legendaries spells so great all the citadel it's essentially plaza of heroes at home it works like plaza of heroes adding colorless or man of any color for legends except you don't get the protection mode so not as strong but if you're trying to build on a budget or just want an extra piece in your legendary deck this seems like a fine addition maybe an even better comparison is its inner planner beacon but it's for legends rather than for planeswalkers and actually since all planeswalkers are legends it actually works like another inner planner beacon for super friends decks too so if you're playing a super friends deck in commander this can be an additional inner planner beacon to help make your mana really really good even though you have to pay a mana and then tap it to make two mana you're still really adding a mana so it is doing a decent job of working like a normal land as far as where to play this it's pretty simple it's legendary matter decks Jota, Sisse, Azika. in those decks it's really solid mana fixing especially if you're five colors and you need really good mana fixing plus like I said super friends legendary style decks fine there as well so I am actually really excited about Great Hall of the Citadel just because it's a common and something we've talked about a lot recently is wizards can make the game much more accessible to players by making the good dual lands commons or uncommons rather than rares Great Hall of the Citadel yeah it's narrow it only goes in specific decks but it's a pretty powerful land that I think will see a lot of play so seeing cards like this show up at common is a really really good thing for players